Good morning, church. Oh my gosh. I am literally overwhelmed right now. My name is Tim Summerlin. I bring you greetings from the Denver church, your sister church. We have a very special relationship with Dallas. And my wife, Jackie, and I could not be more thrilled to be here in Dallas than we could imagine. I've dreamed and schemed about this day for months. And I had no idea. I've traveled the world and met many churches. I've been accepted everywhere. I've never been treated like I have here in Denver or D Dallas. I have and I've never, by the moment we touched down, I have felt the arms and the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth church around us. It's overwhelming, guys, so thank you very much. We've had a tremendous weekend. I want to, again, thank the Lust, the Mancinis, the staff and elders. You guys, we lived here for seven years back in the late 90s, early 2000s. This church is radically progressing, changing. It is, it, you guys are a light to the Metroplex here. I'm telling you right now. And so today what I want to do I just want to summarize a little bit from the weekend, nice. and then we're going to have a communion time that might be a little bit different for you. Okay. We're going to do some meditation, okay? <laughs> so stay with me on this thing. Okay. Years ago at uh, Colorado State University, I went to a class, a course called Contemplative Something or Other, and I was like, yeah, this is great. It's pastoral counseling. What it was was a class full of people to learn about all the world religions. I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm the only guy in the class. I'm the only Christian guy. And it was all a bunch of burned out people that didn't like church. And then every day they had somebody come in to teach a different religion. I felt really insecure. I don't know much about theology and all these other places. So I was a little bit insecure. But I learned a valuable lesson that, that uh, summer. That when I don't know what to say about my God, the one thing I can always do is I can go back to Jesus. I can say, well, Jesus said this once, or he did this once. And you know what happened? Everybody stopped and said, really? I didn't know that. And I learned that I can base my life and my theology and my Christianity on the man Jesus. Amen. So that's what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes today. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says this. In the past... God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. Listen, God took a man. God squeezed himself into a man so that we could connect to him. Jesus, when you want to know about God, Jesus lives like, he talks like, he feels like, he hurts like, he loves like an indescribable God. The Bible says God is indescribable. You can't grasp God. Try as you might, you will never grasp the entirety of God. But you know what? He squeezed himself into this man. And he said, here I am, guys. Touch me. Walk with me, and you'll know who God is all about. Jesus is our healer. I built a ministry and wrote books based on the healing power and the heart of Jesus himself. This weekend, we got to talk about a lot of stuff. It was big. It was thick. I threw a lot of stuff out there. You know, they say in Dallas, it's big. So go big or go home, right? So that's what I decided. I'm going to come in here and just throw it all out. I hope you did something with it or you will, right? Jesus, though, presents himself in weakness. Matter of fact, he once said this. He said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Essentially what he said at the very weakest moment of my life, when I'm going to allow unjust men to kill me, that's going to be the greatest attraction to the world. 
Isn't that what attracts you to Jesus? His weakness. So when we talk about loss of, of all the different losses in our life this weekend, we landed on something I want to share with you, and then we're going to jump into our communion in just a moment. When we hit loss in our life, and we all experience major losses, don't we? We went through a gamut of them over the weekend. There is a stopping point for all of us where we don't have answers. We cannot, I cannot explain my cancer, you guys. God has not written it in the sky. Here's why you got cancer, Tim. To me, it doesn't seem right and fair. All of us have stopping points. And what we talked about this weekend, I think the most important thing we did, is we talked about Jesus being our memoria. That Jesus is our stopping point. He's our foundation. He's the crux of how we get answers. That when there's no more answers in your life, when you're stuck and you can't explain things, he is our peace that we go to. What is it about Jesus that makes him a memoria? What is it about him that makes a statement? Well, here's a couple thoughts for you. Number one, Jesus is the ancient of days. He's always been, and he always will be. You can go to a cemetery in England that's two or 300 years old, and those graves are all sinking in the ground. Those are memorial stones, but they're sinking. You don't even know who they represent anymore. Jesus always was. He always will be. He resolves all of my hurts in a way that no man can touch. Jesus covers every possible unique loss that I have in my life. You know, he even covers my losses as I go through life. In other words, many of us have losses that never get resolved. But he's the one I go to over and over and over again to say, Jesus, help me with this peace of my heart. I don't get it. I'm hurting. He's my memoria. We talked this weekend about our identity is not based in our losses. That God makes it very clear that our identity is first and fully based in the man, Jesus Christ. And we did an exercise where the crowd yelled out, you know, 80 or so names from the Bible on who we are. We don't have to identify ourselves by the hard things in our lives. They hurt, they're there, we struggle with them, but our identity is not based in those pieces. We talked about the powerful concept of forgiveness with one another. And forgiving ourselves, the powerful way that changes us and it softens us and it returns innocence into our lives. And how it restores a relationship with somebody that may have hurt you. You may have people in this very audience right now that you're hurt by, that you don't talk to anymore. They come up in your heart over and over again because something happened. Forgiveness in a relationship can heal that. And Jesus provides that as he forgave us. We finally talked about something in my life that's personally changed me so much. And that's the idea of space. In the last couple of years, I've really worked hard on contemplative practices in my life. I want to know, how do I intimately connect to God? I know the doctrines, I know what I'm supposed to do and be. We're pretty good at all that, aren't we? Like we study our scriptures, we, we really wanna be right with God that way. But I wanted to learn how do I intimately connect to God? I got the doctrine, good, I'll keep working on that, but I wanna intimately know God. The Bible says, this is eternal life, it's to know me. It's a very intimate knowledge. It's the same kind of knowledge that my wife and I have grown in over the last 40 years of our lives. We went from learning each other's names and families and what was it like when you were a kid and all these different things. And then we got into like, what are your dreams and hopes? And then we got into things like, I'm a sinful guy. <laughs> Let me confess sin to you and go through those hard times. And now as I'm facing my end date in a couple years, we're intimately connected when I have meltdowns. The other day I had a meltdown where I just, I just bawled. And she just sat with me for a long time in my tears. That's called intimacy. 
That doesn't happen overnight. You guys, my goal is I want to know Jesus intimately. And that's what God's providing in our lives when we work on contemplative practices. So we talked about things like meditation. We talked about meditating on the Word. How do you spend ample time just chewing and just soaking in the Bible? Not reading it just to learn things, but actually soaking your heart into the Scriptures. How the Holy Spirit inside your heart intimately speaks to you as you, as you spend ample time in the Word. We talked about that, and then finally we spent some time talking about the Sabbath. And we talked about this idea of building space in our lives. We wanted to know that. And so Jesus brings all that together for us. The other day I was in the hospital. My, my friend uh, Chris Jacobs came by to do communion with me. He's a wonderful man. He's really helped me so much. And I was getting a little confused in my life. I'm, I'm reading a lot about the new earth. You know, when I got my diagnosis, I started buying books on heaven. I'm like, okay, here we go. And I'm really getting into this idea of the new earth and what's it going to be like when they bring heaven down to earth and what is it going to be like? Am I going to, you know, am I going to sit in a room with a lazy boy chair and watch NHL reruns the rest of my life, and, you know, with an amber beer and just kind of like be all by myself? <laughs> what's it going to be like? And I'm learning like it's going to be amazing. It's going to be, there's going to be projects to do. There's going to be lakes to walk around. There's going to be people to fellowship with that you've never met before. My basset hound's going to run up and, you know, tackle me. Like, hey, you're back, Tim. It's good to see you again. I mean, there's going to be like this amazing, we're seeing everything in 2D right now. We're going to say like 7D color. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be heaven on earth. But then I started getting a little insecure about all that. Like, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is the lazy boy chair, you know. And, and Chris made a statement. He goes, Tim, here's what Jesus says. I am the way. And it halted me and arrested me. And I said, all I have to do, I don't have to understand everything. What I have to do is kind of step on his toes as the way. I just got to be kind of next to him. Like, where, are you walking here? Okay, I'm walking with you. Oh, you're going to go here? Okay, I'll just I'll do this here. With, all I have to do is be in the way with him. He might be like, Tim, you're in my way. I'm like, yeah, exactly. I'm in your way. That's what you told me to do. That's what I have to do, guys. That's what we do in our lives. Is we go, where is he? Okay, let me just kind of pony up next to the guy. And I'll be okay as long as he's leading my way. So they asked me months ago, John, John had this thing about, Tim, come talk about Hertz, but talk about the vision for the future of the DFW church. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not even going to be around in the future. You guys figure it out. You young people over there, you guys get working on this thing, okay? Because all these old guys, they're kind of fading away. All right? You guys are going to have to figure that thing out. But here's my vision. You're welcome. <laughs> but here is a vision I have for the ICOC. We have an amazing fellowship around the world, guys. Never get used to what's happened. What we've been part of for 40 years is amazing. It's unique. It carries on. It has a base and a potential right now to explode once again. We have pieces in place right now that are setting us up for the Holy Spirit to come back in in unique ways of doing things that we cannot imagine. I believe that. But here's my vision for this congregation and the churches around the world. In the coming years, my vision is that we learn as a fellowship to intimately connect to Jesus. We'll keep doing the doctrines. We'll keep doing the evangelism. Those things are essential. We'll keep discipling one another. We'll keep sacrificing and giving. But as a church, I want us to be known as those are the people, they know Jesus intimately. Like there's something about those people. 
You talk about attraction. When people are tired of doctrine and other religions, and they find people in small groups that are connected intimately to Jesus. As we get ready for communion, I want to let you know something. Uh, we, we wrote a book on contemplative practices. I got about 10 therapists in the ICOC to write me a chapter, and then I, I did the introduction to slap my name on the front. Um, not a bad plan, actually. And um, I've got some for sale over here, so I'm going to be hanging out over here. I would love to meet many of you afterwards. Get a book. Start working or continue working on this idea of building space for God to get inside you. All right? It's a great area of growth right now. So let's shift now into communion. If I could ask you just to calm your souls for a moment. You know, whatever happened before church this morning, kind of see if you can kind of divorce yourself from that for a bit. I want to do a meditation communion for you. Recently, I read a book called Gentle and Lowly Heart of Jesus. It changed my life radically. The Gentle and Lowly Heart by Dane Ortland. As you consider changes in your life and what God may have in mind for you, you might run into walls of failure. As you begin to look to the future, your past may haunt you. I want to ask you to relax for just a moment and consider some things. Do you remember the day you became a Christian? Or maybe right beforehand or right afterwards. And you had stuff in your life that was really problematic. And like a twig, God just broke it. I remember the first time... I realized I didn't cuss one time today. I'm like, how'd that happen? I was, I was so used to dropping F-bombs everywhere and being rude and crude as, as I could be. And I remember the first time I thought, I don't think I cussed today. I remember the first time I went to a concert without getting drunk. I thought, how do you do that? I actually came in sober and I left sober. I'm like, this was amazing. Don't we appreciate it when God just breaks like a twig? We're like, thank you, God. I have no idea how it happened. All your friends are blown away. Like, how'd that happen to you? And we love that, right? Got to get a good amen on that one. Right. I know Margaret did. She, I've heard her story. Woo! But then there's branches. Those are those thick honking things that you don't break over your knee. I've tried to break them over my knee, and I end up breaking my knee, right? You know, a branch is kind of like something you work on for a long time. Maybe you go to support groups, you read a bunch of books, all the brothers are in there pounding on you. Maybe time goes by, you pray a lot. And eventually, God breaks that branch in your life after a long time, right? We do a lot of support groups with addictions, that kind of stuff, and we see those releases. And for that, we're always thankful, aren't we? We're like, wow, God, thank you. I mean, I had to really go after that thing. It wasn't a twig, but you changed it. And people around you in the church are like, brother, you're different now, or sister, you seem different. But then there's logs, a big old honking log, right? You don't break those bad boys. You don't get to chisel them away. They certainly don't go over your knee. I want you to think right now about a log in your life. It's been there a long time. Maybe it changes, and then maybe it comes back. Maybe it's a little different, and then it comes roaring back in your life, maybe even late in life. It's a log. It's heavy. You know all about it. Maybe your spouse knows all about it. Maybe some of your best friends know all about it. Maybe they've just accepted that in your life. But it's a log. In Matthew chapter 11, we find the words of Jesus. It's the only place in the New Testament where Jesus describes his heart. It's the only place. And when he says, here's my heart, 
He uses the words gentle and lowly. He could have said, I'm convicting and committed in heart. I got a hammer heart. Let's go after it in my heart. He didn't do that. He could have used one soft word and one hard word. That would have been reasonable. He uses two words, gentle and lowly. Other translations say humble, meek, mild, free of pride and not arrogant. When Jesus had the chance to describe his heart, he uses the word gentle and lowly. Let me ask you to close your eyes now, if you would, please, just for a few minutes. Close your eyes and take a couple of deep breaths. As you keep your eyes closed and as you relax, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to walk that log image that you're holding in your mind, that one thing in your life that's very problematic. I want to ask you to walk that image into the gentle and lowly heart of Jesus. Walk it in there without any judgment and hand that log over to his heart. When you do that, what do you find? What you find is a gentle and humble heart. It's a heart that invites and attracts us. It's a heart that takes on your burdens and takes on your sins. When we are at our worst, Jesus is at his best. It is what he was made for. When you walk that log into his heart, what words do you hear? Perhaps you hear the words, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or maybe you hear those words from Peter, a simple plea, Lord, save me. Or maybe you hear the words of Paul, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, as we close this exercise, I want to ask you to consider the joy that you find in giving up that log. Leave your image behind in the caring, gentle, and lowly heart of Jesus. Don't bring it back with you, but leave it where it belongs in his heart. Now open your eyes. Brothers and sisters, friends, this is what Jesus was created to be. When we bring our challenges to Jesus, we find a man who does not judge, but heals. And in the areas he does not heal, he answers us with gentleness, compassion, and care. He has a gentle and lowly heart. Before we pray, I want to ask you to do this, to always think about progression and not perfection. This is a lifelong journey for us. Be okay with progressing, but don't seek perfection. That's why Jesus is here. He's the perfection. Would you bow in prayer with me? Yeah. Father, we are so very humbled <laughs> by, the, by the humble heart of Jesus. A man who could put himself in front of us as, you know, our leader and, you know, watch me do it this way. Instead, he presents himself as a humble and gentle man. And that's our attraction to follow him. The fact that he would attract us to him in a way that, that humbles our hearts, softens us, makes us want to be like him. He is everything that you claim to be in flesh and blood. We cannot wait for the day to actually hear his voice and touch him. I don't know what we'll even do. Fall down at his feet, grab his feet. <laughs> I don't know. We might just grab him and hug him. But right now, as we walk this earth and we spend time in communion, as we eat this bread that gives us that reminder of his body that was broken, what an honor to know him. <laughs> 
What an honor to even say his name in front of other people. Like, I know Jesus. <laughs> it's just, it's perfection on earth in my mind to be able to say that. Father, as we drink this cup as a community of church, of believers, of DFW Church, we, we're, we're here as a community, and we drink this cup together, we realize once again that our sins are forgiven, that we walk out of here today clean like the way we walked in. And that is a freedom in that. Father, thank you again for your many blessings. Thank you for this wonderful church that we're part of. Thank you for the amazing grace of God that's represented to us in the man, Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen.